Hello everyone. Very good morning to all of you. I am Ganesh from Central Electrochemical Research Institute, Karaikudi. Today I will be giving a lecture on frontiers of electrochemistry, wherein I will highlight what are the basic principles behind such electrochemical science and technology in general. I will try to highlight what are the very famous and popular techniques and how do you apply such concepts along with the techniques in the field of uh, sensors and electrocatalysis. So uh, before I start, uh, normally I used to talk about where I come from. Uh, basically Central Electrochemical Research Institute, profoundly known as SICRI, is located in Karaikudi, Tamil Nadu. It is one of the constituent laboratory of uh, CSIR, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Uh, in fact, it is the one and only research institute completely devoted to the field of electrochemical science and technology. We cover all facets of electrochemical science and technology in general, starting from looking at the fundamental concepts of electron transfer reaction across the interface to material design, uh, how do you modulate electron transfer, etc., for functional applications and ultimately come up with uh, uh, prototype device fabrication for uh, uh, various applications. Right? As a whole, SICRI uh, works on many different areas of electrochemical science and technology, starting from energy storage, energy conversion devices, biosensors, electrocatalysis, corrosion, uh, metallurgy aspect in general, electroplating, metal deposition. Uh, chloroalkali processes, uh, uh, electro-organic and water uh, electrolysis, water, uh, wastewater management, etc. So, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, in fact, we cover all the areas of electrochemical science and technology in general. Uh, if you look at the history behind it, in fact, the foundation stone was laid in the year 1948 by then Prime Minister Sri Pandit Jawaharlal Nehruji and it was declared open in the year 1953 by then President uh, Sri Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan and during that uh, inaugural function of course uh, 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 the man behind CSIR Sri Bhatnagar Ji was also there uh, during the inaugural function. Now uh, interestingly uh, on 14 January 1953 uh, when Sikri was in fact uh, devoted to our nation uh, the great Nobel laureate Sir C. V. Raman was there. In fact, during the inaugural function, he posed such a question, what are these laboratories going to do? Unless otherwise, the workers in these laboratories feel that it is up to them to do their very best. Otherwise, these laboratories' uh, existence itself will remain as a giant question mark in the sky. Okay? So these are the words from uh, great Sir C. V. Raman uh, during the inaugural function. But I am sure if uh, Raman would have been alive today, he would have been more than happy to see what Sikri has done over the past seven decades or so, starting from uh, you know, uh, uh, providing a coating, corrosion prevention coating for bomb and bridge at Mandabam to development of TSIA, uh, titanium uh, substrate insoluble anode for chloroalkali process, water electrolysis, development of ion selective electrodes, and up to uh, the Make in India product of uh, a lithium ion a cells fabricating facility which has been recently uh, established at uh, Chennai unit. So as a whole I am sure if Ram would have been alive today he would have been more than happy to see what Sikri has done over the past uh, uh, seven decades or so. So uh, with that note uh, let me tell you basically who am I. Uh, I am Ganesh of course I uh, work in the area of fundamental aspect of electrochemical science and technology. I belong to electrodics and electrocatalysis division. I completed my PhD from Raman Research Institute, Bangalore, and I was there at uh, University of Edinburgh, Scotland for three years as a postdoc. I was also a visiting researcher at uh, University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada for a short duration. I am happy to say that I have been bestowed upon uh, uh, the prestigious CSIR Young Scientist Award in Chemical Sciences for the year 2014. Apart from this, I also received uh, a state award, which is uh, Pudhiya Talangurai Nambike Nakshatram Award for Science and Technology in the year uh, 2015. 
if you look at uh, uh, research wise my group and uh, as a whole uh, we focus on uh, the fundamental aspect of electrochemistry and we do take concepts a little bit from material chemistry as well as biology to come up with sensors and devices mainly uh, uh, mainly focusing on energy and environmental sciences and for biomedical sciences so as a whole if you look at it keeping electrochemistry as a core we do a multidisciplinary research approach to tackle uh, issues related to healthcare diagnosis and for energy and environmental uh, applications so today uh, what i will do i will talk about the importance of electron transfer reaction uh, why electrochemistry is such a powerful technique and we will do a multidisciplinary approach strategies to modulate electron transfer at the electrode electrolyte interface and i will also talk about what will happen if we introduce so let's say a different size and shape based nanomaterials at this interface and how do you modulate uh, electron transfer reaction changing rate constant uh, using such nanomaterial why i worry about uh, you know uh, such kind of modulation of electron transfer reaction is because once you can able to tune such electron transfer reaction across interface you can bring in applications in many different areas not only just sensors and catalysis also in terms of energy storage and energy conversion devices and for many applications involving electrochemical uh, science and technology as a whole right now uh, uh, what is electrochemistry as a whole right uh, if you ask me definition of course it's a branch of uh, chemistry which deals with study of electron transfer reactions at interfaces it could be solid uh, liquid electrode electrolyte interface it could be solid gas it could be liquid gas interfaces so any kind of electron transfer reactions which occur at that interface uh, the study which deals with such kind of process is called uh, uh, electrochemistry in general it deals with two different kinds of reaction where in one kind voltage is applied to drive a chemical reaction and in the other case where voltage is generated because of a inbuilt chemical reaction the typical example for the first kind would be a fuel cell you guys should have heard about water being used as a fuel to drive vehicle uh, is it really possible to use water uh, the answer is thermodynamically it is not a feasible reaction because the delta g of that reaction is non uh, delta g of that reaction is positive meaning non spontaneous so water won't split on its own to hydrogen and oxygen but on applying a voltage of about 1.23 volt okay on applying a voltage of about 1.23 volt versus normal hydrogen electrode you can able to split water into hydrogen and oxygen oxygen would evolve at anode and hydrogen would evolve at cathode so that both hydrogen and oxygen could be used as a fuel that's the concept behind water being used as a fuel right so that's the uh, kind of reaction where one can apply a voltage and drive a chemical reaction now in the other kind where voltage is generated because of inbuilt chemical reaction is a typical example could be battery like you know we have all clock in our houses uh, the moment clock stops working what do we do we simply change the battery right so the moment you connect battery uh, the clock starts working how does it work it is because of the inbuilt redox reaction associated with the battery material that provides you voltage and uh, that is the one which drives uh, the clock running right so uh, uh, if you look at classically we talk about where does the potential and the current originates from well uh, the potential originates because of the spontaneous double layer formation at the electrode electrolyte interface or at solid the liquid interface the moment you dip any conducting rod into a salt solution let's say an electrolyte uh, at the interface there would be a spontaneous formation of separation of layer of charges across this interface let's assume the metal have positive charge and the electrolyte will have negative charge this is similar to a parallel plate capacitor model a uh, parallel plate capacitor model what we have studied maybe in our uh, school days right so that leads to a parameter called the capacitance and through an equation which is c is equal to q by e right c is equal to q by e where q is the charge stored at this interface and the capacitance is the one what i just described now this equation 
gives you capacitance how capacitance is correlated with the potential e is the potential so that's where uh, the potential originates in electrochemistry having said that uh, is it possible to measure uh, potential of a single interface the answer is no you cannot measure potential of a single interface so what you do is you do uh, you uh, dip uh, another conducting rod and measure the potential difference between these two dissimilar interfaces okay so such kind of potential difference is the one we usually term this as potential now uh, then the next parameter is current where does the current come from well uh, you guys should have studied about lee chatelier principle right the lee chatelier principle what does it say uh, it says that when the system is at equilibrium when a stress is being applied the equilibrium will shift in such a way that uh, it will it will nullify the stress it will get rid of the stress right so the formation the origin of potential at the interface is a kind of perturbation uh, to the electrode electrolyte interface and in order to get rid of that perturbation the system responds and that response is nothing but your current right so in general uh, uh, we use uh, we can use normally two electrode and three electrodes in electrochemical uh, studies the applied potential uh, would flow between reference and working electrode and the resultant current will flow between working and counter electrode okay uh, so uh, if we look at the electron transfer reaction as a whole, let's assume uh, we have an electrode and we have an electrolyte where the redox uh, species is dissolved. Okay, the following are the different kinds of steps through which an electron transfer reaction occur. Okay, the redox species from the bulk has to diffuse from the bulk to the interface, get adsorbed on the electrode surface, undergo electron transfer reaction. It can either donate an electron and uh, or it can accept an electron from the electrode surface so by donating an electron the species undergoes oxidation loss of electron and by gaining electron the species undergo reduction okay so it can undergo electron transfer reaction gives you product the product has to deserve and diffuse back to the bulk of the solution right so among these processes whichever process is slower is called a rate determining step and usually usually diffusion from the bulk to the interface is slowest among uh, all all these processes okay so such kind of uh, different steps involved in electron transfer reaction could also be analyzed using many different electrochemical techniques okay so i will i'll highlight during the course of time some basic principles and what are the techniques being used to understand such electrode electrolyte interface right uh, when I say you can carry out many different electrochemical techniques, uh, a simple electrochemical equipment would be good enough to understand such electrode electrolyte interface. We use normally a system called potential stat or galvanostat. Okay, why I uh, uh, talk about this potential stat and galvanostat is if you look at the uh, electronic circuit based design, it is very easy to fabricate such potential stat. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, what we need is uh, uh, we need two different kinds of operational amplifier based circuit. One is called voltage follower where the applied voltage should be maintained between reference and working electrode and uh, due to the formation of double layer capacitance and due to electron transfer reaction the system response. The response would be in terms of change in voltage okay that voltage if you pass through a resistor you will measure as a current okay so what we need is initially the voltage follower and the other one is current voltage converter these two operational amplifier based circuit is good enough to fabricate a potential stat in fact the one i show on the right end of the slide is the very first project what i uh, work on the fabrication of potential stat the moment i joined phd okay so of course uh, when I, when, uh, as I mentioned, basically I'm a chemist. But the moment I joined for my PhD, my guide said, uh, Ganesh, you should uh, fabricate a potential stat on a breadboard and demonstrate to me how a cyclic voltammetry works. Okay, so I asked immediately a question, why, why, you know, I should uh, learn about electronics. My my guide was smiling and said that Ganesh, just uh, you know, uh, keep learning and you will understand at the end of the PhD. Okay, so now I do know that. 
uh, unless otherwise I understand the electronics part of how a potential star or a galvanic star works, it would be very difficult for me to directly go and work on electrochemical techniques. So that's why I would like to highlight even before uh, discussing about electrochemical techniques, it is better to understand how a potential star or galvanic star is being fabricated. Okay. So uh, classically, if we look at chemistry, we would have studied many different parameters like concentration, temperature, pressure, etc. is the one which affect rate of the reaction. Apart from this, in electrochemistry, there are two other parameters like current and potential, what I described earlier, could also be used to alter uh, the rate of the reaction. Okay? Uh, this could be done using a simple uh, Gibbs free energy equation. You can see delta G is equal to minus N of E. Recall the two different kinds of reaction, uh, what electrochemistry deals with in general, delta G positive, which is non-spontaneous and delta G negative, which is a spontaneous reaction. The battery, delta G negative, where the uh, stored inbuilt redox reaction gives you an voltage. And the other case where delta G is positive, water splitting reaction, thermodynamically it is not feasible. But the moment you apply a potential, you alter delta G in such a way that you go from a non-spontaneous reaction to spontaneous reaction. Right? So, of course, uh, uh, electrochemistry was known to people uh, long, long ago. People started using a technique called the electrode deposition, where you use two different electrodes, anode and cathode, along with the electrolyte. So, the moment you apply either a current or potential, the metal undergoes a dissolution at anode, and it, uh, when it undergoes a dissolution, a dissolution, it goes as metallic ions, and the electron will flow through the external circuit. The ions would diffuse into the electrolyte part to reach its cathode. Meanwhile, the electron from the circuit also reaches the cathode. Okay, so at cathode reduction occurs where uh, the metal is being deposited. That is the basic principle behind electrodeposition technique. Okay, I mentioned that uh, the origin of potential is due to spontaneous formation of electrical double layer, what electrochemistry usually talk about is a double layer capacitant at this interface. Okay, So there are many different models that have been proposed for uh, describing the structure of electrode electrolyte interface for double layer starting from Helmholtz, Sperrin, Guy, Chapman, Stern model are the one. Okay, uh, if, you, if you look at the definition wise, the Helmholtz Sperrin model uh, describes in a very, very simple term like uh, the uh, charges are simply separated across these two, uh, intro, uh, across this interface. Let's say metal have positive charge and uh, electrolyte will have a negative charge. And uh, these layers are stuck to each layer and that gives you a capacitance. That's the Helmholtz Perrin model. Okay. Uh, but if you measure experimentally, uh, the uh, theoretically predicted from Helmholtz Perrin model do not match with the experimentally measured capacitance value because we do know that in liquid the molecules or species are in random motion and you cannot have a fixed layer of charges in the electrolyte part. Okay. So uh, in order to rectify that model, uh, the next model was proposed by Guy Chapman where uh, they proposed that the molecules in the electrolyte part are in random motion. Okay. So they are diffused into the electrolyte part and they are in random motion and that gives you capacitance. But unfortunately that model also uh, turns out uh, not the right model to describe the interface. And finally uh, Stern proposed the right model. He is a clever guy. What he did was he simply uh, coupled the, uh, the above two models. Okay. So he mentioned the ions from the electrolyte are not only stuck at the interface but it is also diffused into the electrolyte part. And uh, 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 in these models, I would like to say that even Sikri has contributed to uh, describing the double layer structure. The fourth model of electrical double layer was proposed by a person called uh, Devanagan. He was doing a postdoc when uh, the famous Bokris was working at uh, Sikri Karakudi. So that model is called the Bokris Devanagan model, which is the fourth model of electrical double layer. What they did was, they added uh, the uh, contribution of dielectric constant of solvent and dipole, uh, di dielectric, dipole uh, orientation of solvent molecules at the interface. Okay, so that the measured capacitance precisely matches with the theoretically uh, proposed model by Bakris and Devanathan. So that's the 
kind of uh, electrical double layer uh, we talk about okay now uh, so uh, classically if we look at it you guys would have studied about uh, this faraday's laws of electrolysis when you talk about the metal deposition uh, the first law states that the amount of any substance deposited by this electrochemical uh, reaction is directly proportional to the quantity of electricity passed okay and the second law talks about suppose if you have two different metals deposited on the same uh, cathode uh, the amount of different substances deposited on the electrode is uh, uh, directly proportional to their corresponding equivalent point. Okay, so that's the uh, law proposed by Faraday in the very beginning. Now, uh, I mentioned that the current comes because of uh, uh, the perturbation from the equilibrium through Lee Chatelier principle. Now, why one has to worry about equilibrium? Well, how do you define an equilibrium? First, we will understand how do you define an equilibrium, right? Uh, you can define an equilibrium by uh, the following ways, meaning rate of forward is exactly equal to the rate of reverse reaction. And in uh, there is no mass change between forward and reverse reaction, meaning delta M is zero. And there is no current change between forward and reverse reaction. In case of electrochemistry, delta E is also zero. Unless otherwise a system satisfies all these uh, three conditions, you cannot term the system as a equilibrium. Okay. So why do you worry about equilibrium? Because equilibrium is the state where the electrode electrolyte interface exhibits its real characteristics. Okay. So normally uh, I teach my students in the class with an example. Uh, let's say suppose a person got a gold medal during uh, his or her master studies. Okay. Uh, when he or she goes to the stage receiving the medal and uh, coming out from the other side of the stage suddenly some friends uh, go and uh, talk to her you know uh, they won't express their so called uh, normal behavior at that moment because they are at the excited state but on the other hand when they uh, come to the classes daily they would uh, they may be a good friend to all and they may be a obedient student uh, they are they are good in learning uh, and expressing their thought etc okay so those those qualities may be their real characteristic but during the excited state they will think that at that moment they are the person they know the subject very well okay so that may not be the real characteristic so that's why understanding the system at equilibrium is very critical in order to understand the complete characteristic of the interface okay so why do you uh, why do you worry about uh, such kind of reactions because uh, because of uh, the inbuilt chemical reaction the electron transfer reaction which only occurs at the interface okay so compared to many other technique uh, uh, many other even concepts electrochemistry is a very very powerful technique why because the complete electron transfer reaction which occurs only at the interface the typical thickness of the interface is of the order of only nanometer level okay so at that nanometer level even if we apply hundreds of millivolt the electrode electrolyte interface will feel okay you can calculate the voltage felt at this interface would be voltage uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, voltage divided by distance right so even if you apply 100 millivolt within the nanometer level separation, the electrode electrolyte will feel as if it is 100 into 10 power 6 volt per meter, V by D, you can calculate, right? So that's why uh, the electrochemistry is such a powerful technique because if even if you apply 100 millivolt, the system will feel a humongous voltage, a very, very significant higher voltage of 100 million volt per meter at the interface. And that's why many reactions which are not uh, possible to carry out by classical chemistry means it is it is possible to do with the help of electrochemical techniques okay so the current essentially comes from three different modes of mass transfer like migration diffusion and convection migration deals with movement of charged uh, species under the influence of uh, electric field it's a electric field potential gradient okay and diffusion contributes to mass transfer which is nothing but movement of species under the influence of a chemical potential it's a concentration gradient and convection is nothing but uh, movement of species because of stirring or a change in hydrodynamic uh, transport etc okay but keep it in mind that 
all the equations in electrochemistry are derived based on the assumption that diffusion is the predominant mode of mass transfer. So you need to eliminate basically uh, contribution from migration and convection. How do you eliminate? Well, uh, we can use supporting electrolyte, meaning a simple salt like sodium chloride, lithium fluoride, uh, sodium fluoride, sodium uh, sulfate, etc. These species will not take part in any electron transfer reaction. Rather, it will just take care of the current contribution from migration. Okay. So normally, we use 100 times higher concentration of supporting electrolyte compared to the concentration of the redox probe, uh, what one would like to analyze. Convection you can eliminate by using a Faraday's cage and by not disturbing you know, the, electrode, the electrochemical cell as a whole okay, in order to avoid vibration etc. So that the measured current would be purely from the process of diffusion. When I talk about diffusion, there are two different laws of uh, diffusion. They are uh, proposed by Fick. So they are called Fick's laws of diffusion. The first law states that the flux, diffusional flux, is directly proportional to the concentration gradient. Flux is the one which contributes to the current component. Okay. The equation says flux is equal to d dou by by dou x. That is the concentration gradient where d is the diffusion coefficient. The second law deals with, uh, when I say concentration gradient, it is the uh, change in number of molecules at interface to the number of molecules at the bulk. Okay, this change in concentration is the one which is described by dou by uh, by dou x. Now, the second class states that in addition to this concentration gradient, also with respect to time, how the concentration profile changes and how it affects the diffusion coefficient, in turn the resultant current. Okay, so that was proposed by uh, Fick's second law. Now, uh, electrochemistry offers uh, many different ways to understand electrode electrolyte interface okay so i talked about equilibrium why the equilibrium is important because the system exhibits real characteristic at this interface okay so you can use techniques to understand the system at equilibrium also you can apply a very small perturbation and then look at how the electrode electrolyte interface changes and then you can apply a large field perturbation and see how uh, the interface behaves okay so uh, potentiometry is a technique which is you been widely used to understand the system at equilibrium and Nernst equation is the one which governs the potentiometric technique uh, you can see that the measured potential uh, is correlated with the equilibrium potential and the activity uh, of the concentration meaning the activity of the redox species okay so uh, then this is uh, the bread and butter of uh, electrochemistry, I would say, which is called a, a butler olmer equation. This is the equation which describes the relationship between current and potential under all given conditions. Okay, at equilibrium, minimal perturbation and a large perturbation. And from this equation only, many other equations are derived based on the approximation. When you, uh, let's say, when you apply a very small over a potential of less than 20 millivolt or so, you would end up with the equation of a, an equilibrium like I is equal to I naught eta M by RT, where I naught is an exchange current density, which is a very critical parameter uh, to measure in order to understand the concept of current, uh, concept of current arises due to corrosion and then electrocatalysis process. Okay. So if you apply a slightly larger potential, but within the linear of uh, current potential regime, you would end up with a Tafel relation where eta is equal to A plus B log I, where A and B are designated as Tafel slopes. So keep it in mind that anyone who would like to, you know, understand the concept of uh, electrochemistry as a whole, it is very much essential to understand how this butler almer equation uh, works. Now, uh, there are many different techniques being used. For example, in the case of equilibrium, as I mentioned, one can use potentiometry. You can also measure uh, the double layer capacitance and surface tension. How does it change even the open circuit potential? That gives a, a very good information about the interface. Okay, How does that change with respect to concentration of the species or with respect to time? Okay. 
and uh, there are techniques like uh, uh, transient techniques meaning how do you change the time domain recall the fixed second law how the concentration profile changes not only with respect to diffusion uh, uh, not only with respect to concentration gradient but also with respect to time how the concentration profile changes right so the transient techniques like voltammetry uh, in, in case of voltammetry, uh, cyclic voltammetry, linear sweep voltammetry, pulse voltammetry are the techniques uh, using time domain. How do you vary the time to understand the electrode electrolyte interface? And <clears throat> we also have steady state techniques, for example, impedance, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy uh, provides information about quantified information about the electrode electrolyte interface and many different parameters you can measure, like. Uh, double layer capacitance, uncompensated solution resistance, charge transfer resistance, etc. Okay. So, uh, in general, what we look at is how either the current potential or the charge changes with respect to time are the one these techniques deal with. Okay. So, if you control the potential and look at the, how the response of electrode electrolyte interface changes due to electron transfer reaction, those techniques are called potentiostatic and if you change the potential with respect to time you apply a ramper etc then those techniques are called potentiodynamic similarly when you apply a constant current that technique is called galvanostatic and when you apply a current pulse or change in current ramp with respect to time those techniques are called uh, galvanodynamic techniques okay so, as I mentioned, you guys should have uh, performed a simple potentiometric experiment during your, uh, you know, undergrad studies, where what we do is we measure the equilibrium potential and uh, how the uh, resultant uh, electrode electrolyte interface potential changes with respect to a redox reaction or with respect to change in concentration and correlate that relation through Nernst equation, okay. Uh, in this series of technique, uh, the very popular and most widely used technique is voltammetry technique, essentially cyclic voltammetry and the linear C voltammetry. So, in case of linear C voltammetry, what we do, we apply a linear ramp of potential with respect to time, okay, a linear variation of potential with respect to time at a fixed scant rate, which is new, that is nothing but uh, dE by dt, how the potential changes with respect to time. And with respect to scan rate, how the resultant output, which is called voltammogram, which is a plot between current versus potential, and how that changes uh, with respect to a given electron transfer process. And uh, two linear sieve voltammetry techniques comprise uh, uh, of a single cyclic voltammetry experiment, meaning you can do two linear, uh, two linear ramp of uh, potential with respect to time. And you can look at the response of the system through an voltammogram, which is called a cyclic voltammogram as an output, which is a plot between current versus voltage, okay. And I can tell you that cyclic voltammetry provides many uh, information about electron transfer reaction, diffusion, etc. There are two informations immediately you one can derive from cyclic voltammetry. The moment you see a peak-shaped voltammogram as an output in cyclic voltammetry, you can, say, you can say that there is an electron transfer reaction and the electron transfer reaction is controlled purely by diffusion. That's why it gives a peak shaped voltammogram. Uh, uh, the peak current is correlated with many different parameters like number of electrons, concentration of the species, diffusion coefficient d and the scan rate nu through an equation called a randall savick equation. Okay? By employing such a technique, one can assess whether the given process is a reversible or irreversible process or quasi-reversible process, etc. <clears throat> In this technique, I would say the most powerful technique is an electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. This comes under uh, AC technique, where what you do, you fix a DC potential over which you superimpose a sine wave and uh, you look at the response of the system which is also a kind of sine wave as current versus time and you measure uh, the change in amplitude and the change in phase with respect to the input signal. Since this is a AC uh, sine wave perturbation, 
the change in amplitude and phase is correlated with a parameter called impedance which has real and imaginary component of impedance meaning is it real and uh, is it uh, is it real is is it prime and is it imaginary is is it double prime okay how these two parameters changes provides information about uh, how the double layer capacitance changes how the charge transfer resistance which is rcd that is nothing but the resistance offered by the electrode electrolyte interface towards any charge transfer process okay so how the rct changes uh, with respect to electron transfer process one can understand all these uh, uh, processes using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy the typical output being a nyquist plot which is a plot between is it real versus is it imaginary if we observe a semicircle right the one on the right side of the slide Uh, uh that tells me that the process is completely controlled by charge transfer process okay which is a kinetically uh, uh which is which is a charge transfer controlled process okay on the other hand if you observe a small semicircle and a straight line like the one on the left side of the slide uh that tells me that the given electron transfer process is controlled by uh diffusion the formation of semicircle is due to charge transfer control and the formation of straight line is due to diffusion controlled process okay so thanks to uh, the parallel development in electronics we can able to understand the interface much better by fitting uh, the by uh, fitting an output from impedance to uh, suitable equivalent circuit so that you can able to measure quanti uh, you can able to measure quantified parameters of double layer capacitance charge transfer resistance and in terms of corrosion they term this as uh, polarization resistance and warburg which is w that describes about the diffusion component okay so all these processes on can able to understand by uh, looking at the output of impedance in terms of nyquist plot uh, the other way to describe output in impedance is uh, through bode plot which is a plot between either uh the total impedance change versus the frequency or the phase angle change versus the frequency okay so this would provide information about time constant associated with the uh, electron transfer process which is very critical in case of uh, uh, energy storage and energy conversion devices for example let's assume uh, you have a, a super capacitor meaning you can store the charge at the interface uh, very high charge okay so how do you know that uh, you can uh, or how long the super capacitor can give you the stored charge such kind of time based time constant based processes one can able to understand uh, from the output of impedance spectroscopy okay so apart from this we have many different pulse techniques like uh, pulse voltmetry uh, meaning you can apply uh, the input signal change in potential with respect to time one can apply a normal pulse a reverse pulse a differential pulse square wave and staircase voltmetry are the different techniques and look at how uh, the response of uh, current behaves okay now uh, these pulse techniques are powerful because you can able to distinguish uh, the contribution from faraday and non faraday component uh, recall when i uh, talk about electrochemistry as a whole which is a powerful because of a a uh, very small interface and the total current contribution come from both faradaic which is an electron transfer process reaction or charge transfer process reaction in general the other uh, contribution from current uh, uh, arises due to non faradaic contribution meaning a simple double layer capacitance contribution okay so you can able to distinguish this faradaic and non faradaic components through pulse process okay that's why uh, the pulse techniques become Uh, very powerful now among these techniques amperometry is the most uh, uh, widely used techniques in the field of sensors i would say uh, which is a very simple technique for example you simply apply, apply a constant potential and look at uh, the variation in current with respect to either concentration or time okay so that's the kind of uh, technique where amperometry being employed the good thing is uh, uh, amperometry is nowadays being used in the field of sensors uh, mainly i will highlight some of the aspect in the later uh, part of my talk where we can use even microelectrodes okay 
so far uh, the electrodes what i described could be a bigger electrode where you can use even millimeter or centimeter squared area of the electrodes on the other hand micro electrodes are uh, electrodes which have dimensions of uh, 1 to hundreds of micron maximum okay 1 to 100 microns you know the typical thickness of our human hair is roughly about 75 micron okay so you can imagine it's like a single hair of the electrode why why micro electrodes are being used well there are many different advantages like <clears throat> uh, you can overcome uh, you can overcome the problem from mass transfer diffusion you can minimize the ir drop as slow as possible and also you can study very fast kinetics very fast kinetics remember uh, you know why why you you guys think that electron transfer reactions are very important let let me ask a, a, a series of questions just you guys can think about it for example let's say uh, we are we have a good food in the night and we go to uh, sleep okay so who asked us to wake up in the morning maybe disturbance from mobile boyfriend girlfriend etc uh, let's say you wake up okay so uh, you get ready after an hour or two we feel hungry right so why do you feel hungry let's let's assume we also take good food and uh, suppose you go to a bus stop to catch a bus uh, to go to college or university when you look at someone you feel happy and you, when you look at someone else you know you feel irritated meaning you express your emotions let's assume that way so all these things one expresses one one human being or one person expresses within about let's say two three hours why do they do that you guys would say that all these things happen because of biochemical reactions which occur in our body i would go one step ahead and say that all these things happen because of electron transfer reactions which occur in our body okay so the moment you talk of biochemical reactions there are some biological species that can undergo uh, oxidation or redox reaction reduction reaction so uh, in a very very layman language all these things involve electron transfer reactions and study of such reactions through electrochemistry provides a much much uh, uh, much more information to understand the behavior okay so in in that way understanding the electron transfer reaction and that too of the order of 10 power minus 18 10 power minus 19 per second rate constant electron transfer reactions are very difficult to measure through normal techniques and uh, normal bigger electrodes so in in that way micro electrodes play a critical role to understand such a fast reactions it's like uh, you know recording uh, ecg uh, recording ecg you can simply uh, prick your uh, brain cell with uh, micro electrodes and look at uh, the response from neurotransmitter you know like dopamine for example how it's been released okay so uh, one can even control the brain function by pricking the nerve cell using such uh, small micro electrodes and control our thinking so that student could be focused only on the studies you know such such kind of uh, uh, exploratory research one can do through this microelectrodes. Now, uh, electrochemistry, of course, doesn't stop there with uh, uh, so much fundamental uh, discoveries, starting from uh, double air capacitance measurements, surface tension measurement, open circuit potential measurements, potentiometry, linear sieve voltammetry, cyclic voltammetry, etc. Nowadays, even it went on uh, to uh, up to imaging level. Okay. Even you can image uh, the presence of a single nanoparticle on the electrode surface uh, through technique like a scanning electrochemical microscope. And I can tell you that Sikri is also working on such kind of ACCM based technique to understand how our enzymatic reaction uh, occurs. And also uh, you can look at how a single nerve cell, single brain cell behave using such uh, scanning electrochemical microscope. Uh, which is a very important technique here we use two different working electrodes one as a micro electrode working electrode one and the other one is working electrode two as the the bottom apart from the usual reference and counter so that you can use uh, uh, you can you can scan uh, the micro electrode over the surface of the working electrode two and look at how the distribution of any parameter electrochemical parameter like current variation in potential variation in capacitance changes okay so by looking at the variation through mapping through imaging technique one can uh, in fact uh, 
look at uh, how the surface looks in at at very atomic level okay the surface looks at very very smaller level there are many modes of uh, operation uh, behind this accm the basic principle involved being measurement of redox current uh, due to the reaction which occurs at, at the working electrode 2 you can measure such variation through working electrode 1 which is nothing but a micro electrode okay so uh, one can imagine as i mentioned a single nanoparticle present on the surface and in fact even you can analyze how uh, a birth of electrocatalysis you know birth of electrocatalysis on the surface through accm technique we know that if you if you have a catalyst what we measure let's say for electrocatalysis process which i will explain at the later part of my talk like a hydrogen or oxygen evolution reaction okay <clears throat> so uh, what we measure is an average property of a catalyst okay there may be certain active sites present on the surface of the catalyst and those sites alone would give you a catalytic behavior okay so this technique could be used to image where are those techniques so that you can able to understand where it originates where the catalytic behavior originates on the electrode surface using uh, such techniques okay uh, uh, in a in a very uh, funny way if you look at it even the emotions as i mentioned love uh, or lust etc uh, there is a complex chemistry behind this in fact love is a very very complex phenomena which is an emotion triggered by 12 specific areas of the brain and those phenomena one can understand using such kind of very low ultra micro electrodes okay you can measure you can measure how our neurotransmitters evolve how much quantity of the neurotransmitters like dopamine uh, epinephrine uh, those things uh, evolve through this uh, serotonin etc through this kind of uh, electrochemical technique apart from this you can also study a single cell electrochemistry what i explained like a single nerve cell or brain cell you can able to image using such electrochemical technique okay not just uh, uh, you know imaging you can also couple this uh, like a hyphenated technique you can couple electrochemistry with the spectroscopy technique like uh, ir u with raman and you can also understand the mechanism behind uh, such kind of uh, electron transfer reactions okay so so far what i was trying to highlight is some of the basic concepts behind electrochemic uh, electrochemistry as a whole and the electrochemical techniques in general and where it could be used okay now taking uh, this kind of concept to an application level uh, i will highlight uh, the applications in the field of electrochemical sensors electrochemical biosensors in general and electrocatalysis okay i will talk about the status quo like where we are at present now in this two field and where we will go where can we go right where can we go uh, in this uh, two different fields now before i talk about uh, what sikri as a whole is doing on electrochemical sensors and electrocatalysis let me go by a few classical book based definition what sensor is all about uh, sensor is nothing but a device which converts either physical or chemical parameter into measurable electrical signal okay in general uh, it comprises of three different components like sensing element transducer and connected electronics okay let me give an example with uh, let's say uh, you guys would have heard about uh, glucometer which is available in the market what do we do uh, you guys would have uh, uh, heard about the glucometer right which is being used to measure uh, how much glucose is present in our blood okay so what do we do you prick your finger take a drop of blood put it on a disposable flexible electrode and uh, insert that strip into a device and the device would give you reading and you would say this is the amount of glucose which is present in the uh, our blood right so this device is a typical example of a device which is being developed by multidisciplinary research approach okay the the flexible strip actually has an enzyme called glucose oxidase which converts glucose to glucuronic acid and the hydrogen peroxide okay so the moment you insert this strip into a device the device is nothing but a electrochemical device the two operational amplifier based circuit diagram uh, the moment you insert that strip into a device the device 
would electrochemically either oxidize or reduce how much hydrogen peroxide is produced through this enzymatic reaction and that's how the glucometer which is available in the market works and that's the kind of sensor uh, we talk about so in this the sensing element is nothing but a flexible electrode the enzyme based one transducer is nothing but the enzymatic signal the amount of hydrogen per uh, peroxide produced through this enzymatic reaction and the connected electron is, is nothing but your ha uh, small handheld device which measures uh, through current how much hydrogen peroxide is produced okay so that's the uh, typical kind of sensor what we talk about now uh, in this slide you would see uh, 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 a flow chart or a protocol of uh, how a chemical sensor work right so you pass through filter we have a recognition site it is not necessarily just the electron transfer reaction you can also measure the change in ionic concentration change in temperature change in polarization of light or change in intensity of light all those changes could be picked up by transducer and through electronics you measure uh, the electrical signal in case of electrochemical sensors these are uh, nothing but uh, a device that interacts either chemically or electrochemically with analyte but the produced signal that is being monitored using electrochemical technique so that's the uh, definition for electrochemical sensor as i mentioned one can measure the change in potential and correlate directly with the concentration of the analyte that is called a potentiometric technique recall nance equation uh, what we discussed a while ago or amperometry where you can measure the change in current with respect and correlate directly with the concentration of the analyte one can also measure either resistance or change in conductance with respect to concentration and those techniques are called uh, uh, conductometric technique okay so these are some of the characteristics of electrochemical sensor where uh, the uh, size of the analyte should be very very small remember the glucometer they take only a drop of blood just a, a prick your finger take a drop of blood right and uh, the sensor should be selective specific and it should be reproducible and it should give you very accurate reading etc and the response time should be quick right and uh, uh, if it is reusable and renewable surfaces which is handy for uh, 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 the fabrication of electrochemical sensors in general right <clears throat> now uh, what is a biosensor so uh, in the case of sensing element if we use biological species like enzyme or antibody or microorganism or even a whole cell itself and look at how Uh, the electroactive species changes concentration of the species changes or even how the ph changes with respect to analyte binding or temperature etc those things uh, would be picked up uh, by the signal transducer convert to a measurable electrical signal and you can come up with uh, how uh, uh, the uh, specific ion could be or specific species could be detected using the principle of biosensor that's how uh, the biosensors work right now uh, in fact sikri is being involved in the uh, development of uh, many different ion selective electrodes over the past few years in fact uh, uh, we were working on uh, developing uh, reference electrode like silver silver chloride reference electrode many different ion selective electrodes specifically for chloride na plus k plus etc so uh, uh, while we discuss about the fabrication of uh, such sensor the very easy way to do is through uh, self assembled monolayer formation meaning uh, which is very easy to form on the electrode surface it uh, there is a single layer of molecule on the electrode surface uh, it it forms because of the spontaneous chemisorption of a molecule on the electrode surface okay so it is very easy to fabricate meaning you simply take an electrode uh, drop it into the solution of a molecule uh, uh, of the layer what you want to prepare and you allow a certain time duration and with respect to uh, time you would see that it it forms a very well organized single layer on the electrode surface called the self assembled monolayer well why such sam is very important it it forms an appropriate framework to investigate the electron transfer reaction and uh, you can see that the length and nature of the bridge affects that electron transfer reaction for example <clears throat> here you can see that for a given fixed length of only 7 angstrom the aromatic moiety 
mediates electron transfer reactions thousand times higher than the corresponding similar length of aliphatic component because we do know that the aromatic moiety have a, a pi electron density distributor ring uh, so that actually helps in mediating such uh, electron transfer reaction uh, and apart from this you can also uh, understand how the biological enzymatic reaction or works in our body for example you can you can develop biomimic catalysis biomimic uh, catalyst using such kind of some based uh, uh, electrodes <clears throat> here you can see that uh, uh, cytochrome c oxidase model is being mimicked on the electrode surface and here also you can see that compared to aliphatic <clears throat> the aromatic moiety mediates electron transfer reaction roughly about 10 power 4 times higher than uh, the corresponding aliphatic one right so uh, and uh, when you investigate such kind of uh, enzymatic reactions on the electrode surface during the process you can also introduce many different uh, uh, nanomaterials okay many different uh, shapes and different size of nanomaterials onto the electrode surface so that you can able to mediate you can able to modulate the electron transfer uh, across this interface one can use uh, uh, structures like simple gold nanoparticles are quantum dots, uh, the very famous being graphene quantum dots and uh, uh, gold nanostars etc. In fact, uh, SICRI has been involved uh, in, in investigating such kind of uh, electron transfer mainly associated with the enzymatic reactions uh, uh, over the past decade also. Uh, so what we find it <coughs> uh, compared to the one without nano structured materials the one with uh, nano uh, stars or nanoparticles based system provides enhanced sensitivity okay I, I described about the typical characteristic of sensor a while ago uh, meaning it should have a very fast response time it should be very sensitive meaning you should be able to measure a very very low quantity of analyte etc and it should be specific and all these things could be tuned uh, using such kind of uh, nanomaterials okay so among many different uh, nanomaterials, the gold nanostars attract uh, 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 attention of researchers uh, nowadays. It is very uh, simple to prepare. In fact, we come up with a simple strategy using a template, using hexagonal lyotropic liquid crystalline phase as a, temple, a template, uh, which is nothing but a, a mixture of water, a surfactant uh, mixture. And by varying the concentration of this mixture, and by adding a different concentration of the salt and allowing uh, the different time duration for the reduction reaction one can able to tune the formation of star, nano stars you can see that uh, uh, bulky core and smaller arm on the other hand smaller core and a bulky arm by tuning such kind of shapes you can able to modulate electron transfer reaction why uh, such kind of arms are important even uh, if you look at it the sharp arms the third one of the image uh, that could also be used to enhance the SCR signal. So we demonstrated a, a label free SCR sensing for uh, different analyte uh, using this technique. Okay. Uh, now uh, over uh, the last decade the SICRI is uh, also involved in developing a uh, sensor for uh, lipopolysaccharide. This is a very uh, important molecule because it provides information about uh, human immune response let's say suppose a person met with an accident uh, God's grace okay uh, suppose a person met with an accident immediately uh, he or she has been taken to ICU okay so where it is important to know whether a patient will survive or not and this molecule would provide information about our immune response system and if you uh, that molecule is called a lipopolysaccharide usually it presents on the outer cell wall membrane of uh, bacteria okay so if you look at the uh, structure of this molecule which is very fascinating you see there is a long aliphatic carbon chain there is sugar moiety and apart from this there are functional groups present on this molecule so what we did was we developed a receptor for each of these functional components okay we developed receptors for each of these functional components and of course these components are like a pattern you can assume and they are different to each other so using a hydrophobic interaction what I described uh, Sam a while ago we anchored this LPS on the electrode surface 
and we added a specific receptor zinc based dipyridyl i mean based zinc complexes to bind specifically to phosphate and we look at the binding of these molecules so that you can able to detect lps as a whole the uh, uh, the uh, higher toxicity of this lps comes due to the presence of negative charge on the electrode surface so once the uh, uh, on the molecule so once these receptors go and bind to each of this component the negative charge be neutralized and you can monitor the change in such kind of uh, charges using uh, impedance using a charge based redox probe you can look at the binding through electrostatic interaction uh, by measuring the impedance and uh, using such strategy we come up with a, a complementary pattern based recognition receptors for specifically sensing lps kind of molecule uh, and even you can detect up to nanomolar level concentration which is uh, very very critical so that's the uh, kind of sensors uh, what sikri has been uh, developing over the past few years okay <clears throat> i'm i'm trying to highlight only uh, uh, a few uh, important things and uh, maybe i will talk about where we will go uh, in the future too right so not just uh, uh not just being uh, pricking the blood and like a inv invasive technique pricking a blood uh, uh, and taking uh, pricking your finger and taking your blood out of it you can also use flexible electrodes flexible and disposable electrodes as a sensor so uh, remember when when i was a student actually uh, my teachers during my masters used to take classes for us through uh, ohp sheet overhead projector sheets okay so we will reuse it Uh, maybe about a couple of times uh, three times or so and then we will throw out so what we did is we have modified such kind of ohp sheets using a simple electrochemical technique and we demonstrated them to be a potential sensor for glucose analysis for example uh, like a disposable uh, electrodes which is available in the market even you can fabricate using uh, such kind of uh, ohp based electrode a slight modification in the uh, 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 procedure uh, to anchor uh, substrate on the electrode surface here we deposited zinc uh, uh, so followed by silver so that these uh, strips flexible strip based the electrode could be used specifically to detect pesticide okay so here we demonstrated detection of methyl parathion one can monitor uh, the redox reaction changes associated with the methyl parathion structure and such kind of redox changes could be measured using uh, pulse technique what i mentioned about dpv differential pulse voltammetry technique so that such flexible strips could also be used for the detection of uh, pesticide okay now uh, electrochemistry is also been used to synthesize uh, many different materials like uh, electrosynthesis is a very uh, fascinating topic here we demonstrate using a very simple technique like you take a graphite rod and platinum cathode and use a electrolyte and do an electrolysis you simply apply a various voltage and uh, depends upon the time duration of the electrolysis we come up with a strategy where you can simultaneously prepare both uh, let's say fluorescent graphene quantum dots and the reduced graphene oxide okay so what we do is we do an electrolysis you take the electrolyzed electrolyte part you add a reducing agent and stir it for a specified time duration and after a certain time duration of course depends upon uh, the nature of reducing agent you can able to tune the emission colors which arises from the supernatant into uh, green yellow blue etc and the settled precipitate is nothing but uh, your uh, rgo reduced graphene oxide okay so in fact we analyzed uh, what is the mechanism behind the such kind of formation we also measured what's the quantum yield of such fluorescent uh, uh, graphene quantum dots and we demonstrated application in the field of bio imaging specifically for uh, uh, e coli uh, imaging where you can see that uh, this e coli uh, uh, has taken up this uh, gqds and when you excite it with a fixed wavelength uv uh, wavelength you can see that it emits uh, beautiful colors like blue yellow or green etc so that you can able to imagine uh, you can able to uh, look at where these uh, microbes or bacteria are present right so that could be used for even water analysis using such techniques 
and the reduced graphene oxide where we demonstrated that to be a good supercapacitor electrode for charge storage purposes okay so uh, apart from this uh, we are also involved in the preparation of uh, such fluorescent nanoparticle using biological species like enzymatic reaction and you can also tune the emission colors by changing the ph as you can see that at neutral ph uh, the gold uh, nanoparticles prepared using uh, enzymatic reduction using glucose oxidize gives yellowish green fluorescent at neutral ph the moment you go to acidic pH, it emits a beautiful rosy red fluorescent. And when you go to alkaline pH, it emits green fluorescence. So, this provides an opportunity uh, for us to tune the emission colors by uh, simply changing the pH using the electrochemical redox reaction which is associated with the uh, enzymatic reaction. Now, the glucometer, watch, uh, what I talked about a while ago, there are, you know, plenty of uh, glucometers which are currently available in the market. In fact, if you take, let's say, about 25 different meters, uh, uh, commercial available glucometer, you would see that uh, different meters give different reading. Okay. So, uh, the variation in the uh, glucose level is roughly about 25 to 30 percent, which is very, very, you know, significant. You can, in fact, say that a patient is diabetic or not by measuring such kind of uh, values and it can it can even provide uh, false information so uh, keeping this in mind sikri has come up with an alternative strategy instead of measuring directly glucose from the blood itself using the glucometer what i described a, a bit ago here we come up with the strategy of measuring glycated hemoglobin okay which is hba1c and we employed a simple boronic acid based chemistry uh, so that you can measure specifically how much uh, glycated hemoglobin is produced and through that we correlated how much glucose is uh, uh, present uh, in our blood okay so we appro uh, we made a non enzymatic approach for uh, the simultaneous determination of total hemoglobin as well as the glycated hemoglobin and you can see that uh, uh, the typical size of a device which is very very small and that is the <coughs> HPA1C sensor meter what Sikri has uh, uh, developed a while ago. Now so far I talked about uh, the status quo where we are at in, in the field of sensor. Maybe uh, a few another 5 or 10 minutes I will talk about what electrocatalysis is all about. And I will give you a few specific examples what Sikri is doing on. And then finally, I will conclude my talk with where we can go from here. Okay. So if you ask me what is electrocatalysis, it is defined as the relative ability of substances that has been used as uh, electrode under the same condition to accelerate the given electrochemical process. Okay. So recall the activation energy barrier classically what we have studied about. So we can reduce that activation energy barrier by uh, electrocatalysis as well. Now, uh, the most common uh, electrocatalytic reaction nowadays is HER, hydrogen evolution reaction, OER, oxygen evolution reaction, and ORR, oxygen reduction reaction. Now, uh, 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 Thanks to development in, uh, you know, uh, demand for the global energy level, people started thinking about alternative sources, okay, and Sikri has been involved in uh, the energy storage and energy conversion devices about the last five or six decades. Uh, we were developing many materials including batteries, supercapacitor, fuel cells, etc. So, uh, these reactions become uh, a rate limiting factor. If you look at fundamental concept behind uh, all those application oriented processes, these are the reactions which are rate limiting step, which can, which can completely, you know, modulate, make the over potential higher, it can introduce efficiency loss, etc. So, it is very critical to understand this electrocatalytic process like HR, OER and ORR, etc. Now, uh, Sikri is being involved in development of uh, various uh, catalysts for tuning such reaction so that you can able to measure uh, different rate constant associated with this 
and tackle the issues what we face in uh, the energy storage or energy conversion devices. Okay. So if you look at the phenomenon wise, let's say we use water as a uh, solvent, the potential window is limited. The moment you go to a positive potential beyond 1.23 volt, as you can see, water split into oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen evolves at anode and uh, hydrogen evolves at the cathode. Okay, so that's a Hachiar reaction. And uh, during the process of uh, fuel cell, let's say oxidation process, the corresponding cathodic reaction is oxygen reduction. And it is very uh, critical to efficiently carry out such oxygen reduction process. So uh, uh, when a complete reduction of oxygen occurs, it goes through a four electron process to water. And if it is partially uh, oxygen reduction, let's say two electron process, it gives you hydrogen peroxide. That can in fact damage the membrane through which the protons has to transport in case of fuel cell. And which can also introduce what is called a polarization loss. So that you need to apply a higher OR potential to carry out such reaction. So in order to maximize the efficiency of such processes, efficiency of fuel cell uh, as a whole, we need to critically look at how these HCR, OER and ORR processes could be efficiently carried out. And for that process, electrocatalysis and development of electrocatalyst becomes very critical. <clears throat> Okay, whenever you talk about a hydrogen evolution reaction, you cannot escape without talking what is called a Volgano plot, okay, which is a plot, nothing, uh, plot between uh, uh, exchange current density uh, versus the MH bond strength, metal hydrogen bond strength. The uh, Goldilocks principle is the intermediate absorption energy. It should not be uh, very strong. At the same time, it should not be very weak as well. So, the compromise between this adsorption energy plays a critical role in evaluating the catalytic property. As you can see from the Volcano plat, platinum is the topmost. As we know that that is uh, the very good catalyst, very good uh, uh, catalyst being used as a cathode in the fuel cell, uh, uh, in the fuel cell devices. And apart from platinum, you can use uh, elements like rhodium, iridium, or rhenium, etc. As you can see, all those things are uh, high, uh, you know, very costly elements and people are working on nowadays to come up with alternative cost effective uh, uh, electro catalyst for carrying out such reaction. Uh, in this process, uh, Sikri has also come up with many different uh, catalytic one. Uh, the simple one being again uh, based on a simple electrolysis process. We use a, a titanium as an anode and again platinum as a cathode. You do a simple anodization at uh, uh, titanium anode, depends upon the variation in the current density and the time duration you allow for uh, uh, electrolysis. You can able to tune such formation of TiO2 nanotubes, porous TiO2 nanotube, okay. So as you can see that you have in some areas uh, clubbed nanotubes and you can alter the length and the ripples along the nanotube. Essentially. You can even come up with a honeycomb based structure and that could be used as an efficient electrocatalyst for uh, water splitting reaction. From the careful plot analysis one can see that compared to the uh, a non anodized one just a bare substrate oxygen evolution is being enhanced roughly about 40, field, uh, 40 fold enhancement in the oxygen evolution reaction and a similar 100 fold enhancement in the rate constant associated with the hydrogen evolution is observed, which is which is very good, right? <clears throat> now, uh, apart from this, when you talk about electrocatalysis in terms of a biological species, uh, the other famous example is microbial fuel cell reaction, where in the anode, what we do is, we use a microbe to do an electrocatalytic reaction, so that you can generate a very small power output from the waste. So this comes under a CSIR, uh, mission of uh, creating wealth from waste. Okay, so what we do is we assemble a fuel cell setup. It is very similar to a fuel cell setup where you have an anode and cathode, where in the anode oxidation reaction occurred and in the cathode reduction reaction occurs. <clears throat> in the anode chamber, we grow a microbe. Here we grow, let's say, an Astrobacter acidi 
this microbes could be even grown from a waste water food industry waste sugar cane industry waste biscuit industry waste etc so that uh, microbes from such kind of waste could be directly anchored onto the electrode surface it grows on the electrode surface with respect to time duration okay and uh, the moment you add any uh, uh, fuel like a kind of source for the microbe to survive you can see that uh, the uh, microbes being anchored onto the electrode surface and it grows as a colony so that the moment you add let's say here an uh, ethanol as a source you can see that up to 150 hours it display a constant voltage as an output roughly about uh, 1.4 to 1.3 volt one can uh, observe and after 150 hours you see that there is a drastic dip in the voltage this could be due, uh, due to two reasons one uh, the microbe is dead or it doesn't have sufficient uh, food to survive but what we observed is the moment you add ethanol the potential shoots up again so that suggests that the microbe is still alive it only needs more fuel to give you a energy output okay so uh, you uh, a single microbial cell gives you in this case specifically about 0.6 volt so you connect to two cells in series you get a 1.2 volt which is sufficient enough to run a wall clock or a digital calculator etc so we demonstrated not just uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, industrial or sugar cane based waste you can also use bad wine you know people used to say that older the wine better is the taste and uh, uh, meaning it is a uh, uh, large higher fermented uh, uh, ethanol so that that could be used as a fuel so we uh, wrote an article called bad wine makes good energy uh, <clears throat> remember these microbial fuel cells are not to produce a large amount of power output like uh, fuel cells or batteries for example this can produce a very small power output like in the order of microwatt to milliwatt that could be sufficient enough to let's say run a small tie car or a glow on led lamp etc so these are uh, the typical microbial uh, fuel cell configurations what we developed in uh, our lab in sikri now uh, when we talk about the microbial fuel cells the biological fuel cell as a whole becomes very much important in fact there are two publications which came out simultaneously at the same time one uh, one <clears throat> comes out with uh, producing a small power output uh, using snail and the other one comes up uh, uh, from uh, producing a small power output from cockroach itself you can see that uh, they prick the body of the uh, body of those insects with small electrodes like a micro electrode and connect them to get a uh, connect them to get a, a power output a very small power output well where you can use that <laughs> you can use such kind of uh, uh, biofuel cells even as a spy you can just attach a small camera on top of the insight and then see you know like a drone uh, what uh, people are uh, doing and uh, uh, such kind of thing could be uh, useful for a very very small power storage uh, devices now uh, where we go from uh, uh, this kind of approach both in the field of sensors and uh, electrocatalysis okay so here uh, uh, a recent paper about uh, three four years ago a group uh, from Ali Javi group from University of California Berkeley uh, they, uh, they come up with uh, a wearable sweat sensor that paves the way for real time analysis of our body chemistry okay so uh, what I talk about invasive technique like pricking uh, uh, your finger take a drop of blood etc in in uh, contrast to this you can use non-invasive technique where you can analyze from sweat itself in fact Sikri is also involved in the sweat and saliva analysis process for developing sensors for various small molecule based analyte when you talk about sweat it is a very interesting concept it is called perspiration okay uh, there are two conditions under which a human being sweat one there is a temperature difference thermal gradient and the other one is being emotional changes let's say uh, uh, for students if suddenly a professor comes and announces the exam then you feel very much agitated you know and you start sweating similarly if someone uh, goes and attend the interview they feel very much uh, tensed and they start sweating 
or even someone comes and proposes to you, we also feel uh, very much tensed, okay? But if you look at sweating, uh, under these two conditions, uh, the sweating process itself is different and the constituent of sweating is different, okay? Under the emotional changes, only certain parts of our body like forehead, our armpit, uh, hand, palms, etc. alone sweat. But in the case of temperature difference, your entire body sweats, okay? And when you analyze uh, the constituents present in sweat, we have components like, uh, you know, sodium chloride, Na+, plus, uh, Cl-, minus, K+, plus, lactate, urea, glucose, etc. So that we can use this sweat as a medium to develop sensor for uh, uh, this an uh, analysis. And in fact, uh, there was a, a famous paper by Joseph Wang. <coughs> uh, he talked about the famous tattoo-based sensor. You can create a tattoo. When I say tattoo, you can impregnate uh, such kind of electrodes to measure specifically the given analyte. Not just uh, using them as a sensor, you can also carry out enzymatic fuel cell, similar to the one what I described as a microbial fuel cell. You can also use sweat as an electrolyte to generate a small amount of power output using the concept called enzymatic fuel cell. And again, using such kind of biological enzymatic fuel cells, you can generate only a very, very small amount of power output, output of the order of microwatt or milliwatt. And that could be sufficient enough, as you can see, even to glow an LED or to use, uh, you know, pacemaker to power up a pacemaker, etc. Or even to run a, a digital clock, wall, uh, digital clock, or uh, hand watch, etc you can use such kind of enzymatic uh, fuel cell applications, okay? So here you can see that uh, directly on skin, these electrodes, disposable, flexible, strip-based uh, electrodes are impregnated on skin, body itself directly, so that when a person does an exercise or he undergoes uh, sweating, perspiration as I mentioned, you can generate small amount of power output, both for sensing purposes as well as for uh, 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 generating a small power output. Now, uh, not just a single electrode, you can also use an array of electrodes so that you can simultaneously detect multiple analytes using such kind of, uh, <clears throat> using such kind of uh, sweat analysis, okay? As you can see here, uh, the electrodes, what I talked about microelectrodes a while ago, you can use array of such kind of microelectrodes so that you can simultaneously measure uh, multiple analyte from uh, uh, sweat analysis. In fact, uh, SICRI is working on, we, we have a, a CSIR funded uh, fast track translation project where the primary aim is to develop such kind of flexible multi-analyte sensing electrochemical platform and we demonstrated using sweat itself you can analyze, you can, uh, analyze the different analytes like lactate, urea, glucose, chloride, Na+, K+, etc. And these analytes could be used as a potential biomarkers to, uh, to understand the uh, health nature of a given person. <clears throat> you know, why, why these electrodes are important? Because uh, nowadays the conditions of, uh, you know, health care is different. People want to do a home-based health care system. They want to know whether... Uh, uh, whatever the exercise I did today is sufficient enough for me to be uh, stay fit and healthy or do I have to do more exercise. So such kind of home based healthcare system and for uh, uh, small kind of analysis you can use uh, such kind of multi analyte sensing electrochemical platform and you can uh, you don't have to even take a blood by pricking your finger you can even simply uh, do a small walking or uh, you know exercise from that you generate sweat and from sweat itself using non-invasive technique you can analyze uh, the health conditions okay so the same concept could be extrapolated to what is called a smart sensing approach for both sports and defense arena you know uh, in case of sports as we know uh, suppose if a person has let's say if, uh, in case of olympics suppose we we conduct a hundred meter field uh, track event <coughs> A person has been uh, uh, taken a drug or not, how do we identify it? We collect basically his uh, urine or blood sample uh, before the start of the race. And after, uh, at the end of the race, you also you collect uh, both blood and urine sample. 
and see whether is there any difference in the uh, biomarker levels, right? And uh, here, uh, the test results usually takes very long time, about even three, four years in uh, some cases. By then, the person would have, you know, already got the medal, got the sponsorships, etc., which is not good. So, what we can do is we can come up with a fabric-based sensing system where you can impregnate such kind of array of electrodes on the fabric so that while a person runs itself, you can monitor how the parameter changes by analyzing uh, from the sweat. So that is the uh, concept behind smart uh, sensing uh, approach. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, uh, just uh, before to conclude uh, my talk, I can uh, very well say that electrochemistry can offer solution to all these global perspectives. Here you can see that it was proposed by uh, Richard Smalley uh, about uh, five, six years ago where you can see that uh, uh, he has listed down the humanity's top 10 problems which we will face in the upcoming 50 years or so. As you can see, the first one is being energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism, war, disease, education, etc. Okay? I can very well say that electrochemistry can offer solution to all these problems. Okay? We do know that energy storage and energy conversion devices, water analysis, and disease, for example. So, uh, such, such a powerful nature of electrochemistry can directly be uh, used to tackle uh, all these global issues uh, from the perspective of uh, keeping the globe, uh, keeping the globe effective for our future generation. Electrochemistry can contribute. Electrochemical science and technology in general can provide solutions to all these problems. Okay. Uh, apart from this. We do have a, a human population across the globe was estimated to be 6 billion in the year 2012 and it is expected to grow roughly twice by 2050. So we need to keep that in mind and uh, provide solution to uh, all this uh, global perspective. And finally, to conclude, I can very well say that electrochemistry, as uh, you have heard over the past uh, one, one hour, one and a half hour or so, uh, it can it can give you more solutions to the societal problems and uh, by taking concepts from material science biology or from other subjects etc by adopting a multidisciplinary research approach you can basically tackle any kind of problem okay so that's the powerful nature of uh, electrochemistry and in conjunction with uh, other subjects it, you can come up with many different sensors, electrocatalysis, corrosion behavior, etc. You can tackle. Ultimately, to come up with uh, smart materials and smart sensing system. Okay, smart materials are like this. Like, uh, for example, let's say I'm talking for the past uh, hour or so, and you guys are listening to me, and uh, you are feeling bored. You know what this guy Ganesh talks about: uh, potential, current, Nernst equation, <coughs> electrochemical techniques, sensors, catalysis, etc and you get bored of it and uh, you want to sleep okay and you slowly when you start sleeping the chair understands that you are not interested so that converts into a sofa so that you can sleep or say you can sleep comfortably okay so that's the kind of smart materials we talk about and keep it in mind uh, the chair can also make you think it can just prick you and say that come on that guy is talking about you know very important topic like electrochemical science and technology in general that could be useful for your future where you can provide solution tackles global issues and you can improve your knowledge through this technique so that material could prick you so that you wake up and start listening to the talk as a whole that's the kind of smart material we talk about and smart sensing is you know when we ride a two-wheeler morning you take a key start your scooter the moment you touch the accelerator from the sweat from hand the speedometer will display and say that hi Ganesh good morning today your blood pressure level is this much and uh, you are healthy and safe and you are allowed to drive you know the speedometer will display and that's the state we are in in the case of smart sensing uh, system so uh, finally in order to do all this we need a multidisciplinary group effort and that's how we can tackle all the societal problems. So finally, thank you very much for patient listening 
and thanks uh, to you all thank you bye